Hi guys, welcome to my channel. I am the Giant Mechanic. Today I'll be showing you my oil change routine, uh, how I approach it, what I do besides just changing the oil in the filter. This video is more meant for apprentices who don't have their own routine and they would like to see how a mechanic that has a couple years of experience approaches all this to optimize time and to do the most at the shortest time possible. And if you guys have any uh, suggestions of how to improve my routine, please leave a comment, but um, let's go into it. But today I'm doing a oil change on a 2023 Mazda CX-5. It is very low mileage. It is the first oil change for the car. I always recommend changing the oil at 5,000 miles or six months, whatever comes first. If you drive a lot in the city and idle, engine all the time i would even recommend doing it um, sooner just to preserve the engine and right here you can see the parts description uh, the part numbers and the actual labor description so we're changing the oil and the filter the very first thing you ever do before doing any job i don't care if it's a small job or it's a big job you check your parts there is nothing worse than putting the car on the lift draining the oil and then figure out you don't have the filter because now you're stuck you're not going to put the old filter back in so always check your parts it will save you a bunch of time it takes only a split second and is very important especially when you're flat rate because every minute counts as you can see at the parts description it says oil drain plug gasket oil filter and of course the oil itself um, i have the filter right here. Today we're using a OEM Mazda filter and here is the washer. So now that we checked our parts, we know we have our parts. Uh, I, we keep the oil in drums, so I'm going to have to pump out the oil and put it in the car rather than fill it by one bottle at a time. Uh, that way when we buy in drums we save money not only for ourselves but for our clients because we're buying in bulk. Um, so now that we know we have our parts, the first thing I do is I'm going to go on a test drive. The reason I'm going on a test drive is because I want the car to warm up. I want the oil to be hot. That way it, it takes all the dirt out of uh, the engine and the oil pan. It flows easier. While I'm on the test drive, I'm gonna listen to how the engine works, how the transmission shifts, if there are any noise in the suspension. Is the wheel straight? Do the brakes pulsate when I press them? There's so many things that you have to know about the car before you do the oil change for two reasons. First reason is you wanna cover your ass. If something's wrong with the car and you just did an oil change and now your car shuts down or whatever and you didn't know how the car operated before you did the oil change, guess whose fault it is? Your fault. Because you're the last guy who touched the car so it automatically makes it your fault that the car failed or the engine doesn't run or whatever. The second reason is you always want to make sure that the car is actually safe, that the suspension is good, the wheel is straight, the brakes are not shot or anything. It's just a common courtesy for the client. And as professionals, we have to make sure that uh, people are safe on the road because the last thing you want is for people driving on the road with cars that are, should not be on the road and then one of them can crash into you or something. And it's just a, a pain and also, if you find anything wrong, you will make recommendations. You will, it potentially will sell that work and that's how you will get more money because if you sell more work, you get paid more. So now I am doing my test drive. My test drives usually take about five minutes. And as I mentioned previously, the goal of doing the test drive is checking is the steering wheel straight are the brakes working properly? Are they pulsating? Is the car vibrating? Do I hear any noise coming from the suspension? Is the car overheating or not? Is the, are the gears shifting properly? Is the engine making any noise that it should not be making? And it is important to do these kind of test drives to, like I previously mentioned, just uh, cover your part where you, there's people sometimes bring their cars, they have known issues and they will say that, oh guys, ever since you did the oil change, you know, I have this, this problem, this noise is coming out. So just to make sure that you are good on your end, because everything I 
uh, fine on the car. I'm talking about uh, car suspension issues, uh, noise, well, uh, damage on the body panels or anything. All of that I eventually will document on our software system. And that way, if the customer comes back 100 miles later and says, guys, ever since you did the oil change, I have this scratch on my body panel or something. And I'll be like, no, sir, we actually saw this body scratch and we documented it. Also, while you're on the test drive, you are warming up the engine oil because hot engine oil flows faster. It will come out of the car faster. From what I've read, when the engine oil is hot, it carries actually all the dirt and the deposits better than cold oil. Also remember guys, this is not a joy ride. We're not doing this for fun. So have the music all the way down so you can hear the car better. I usually turn off the AC just because sometimes when the fan is running at a high speed, you just can't hear like little creaks in the suspension or engine noise or something. Uh, this is also not a race so it's fine to give like fast acceleration fast stopping just to check how the engine works and how the brake system works but i'm doing you know 35 40 miles an hour for the most part like right now i'm checking if this if the steering is straight as you can see i let it go it's driving straight so it's fine don't you know this is not a race you don't need to go super fast the length of the test drive really depends on what are your goals. If uh, there's a customer complain that at certain speeds, you know, funky stuff happens with a car and whatever, the test drive might be a little bit longer just for it to duplicate. But if you're just doing an oil change, you know, three, five minutes is perfectly fine. I also always drive on the same route. So I know like right here, the wheel is straight because the road is straight, the road's not crowned. I'll go through certain areas that will have a couple small bumps just to drive over them to see if the suspension is working properly. There's a couple straights where I can go a little bit faster, nothing crazy of course. And uh, pretty much have your own routine for a test drive that really helps you. Unfortunately, I, my shop is at a place where there are a lot of uh, stoplights, so that kind of uh, limits me when it comes to like a, a consistent drive. But again, if I need speed or be on the road longer without stopping, if I'm resetting a TPMS light or something like that, I might go on a different road or I even might go on a highway, depending on what my goal is for the test drive. But once I'm done with my test drive, I will pull it back in my bay. And uh, from there, we start the actual prep for the oil change and the actual oil change. So right now I am pulling the car into my bay. I try to put it as centered as possible. It's just easier that way to get in and out of the car and set it up on the lift. The car is in my bay. The first thing I do before I exit the car is I will open one of the windows. There is nothing worse than locking the keys in the car and then having to tell your boss, oh, I locked the keys in the car and now we gotta either break into it or we have to call the customer and ask if he has another spare set of keys. Now, shut off the car. I will open the hood. And before I get out of the car, I will look at the tire pressures and memorize them. As you can see, front axle, rear axle, 35 PSI each. That way, when I'm doing my inspection for the car, I don't have to open the door again to check uh, what tire pressures are supposed to be in the front and rear axle. I don't have to go on the computer. It just saves you time. Now that the car is positioned in my bay, I checked what tire pressures are supposed to be in. I lowered one of the windows. Before I do anything else, I will check that the car actually fits on the lift and by fits on the lift i mean that the arms will be positioned in the correct spots that the car is not too much up front not too much in the back that it is perfect this is a safety thing for you yourself first of all you don't want the car dropping on you you don't want the car m moving shifting doing anything and then second of all you don't want the car falling in general and then having that weird phone call from the office and saying hey uh mr you know smith your car just fell down off the lift, so this oil change is gonna take a little bit longer. So before you do any of that, I always check to make sure that the car will actually go on the lift. So I always start by putting up the lift 
in the front on both sides. I'm going to demonstrate you by me just putting the lift on one side, but I will do that on both sides before I do anything. So I have the lift set on both sides. I will raise the lift just a little bit where it engages the car and I will stop right here. And then the next step is I'm going to open the hood. Now I am opening the hood, setting the support bar. So the first thing I do when I open the hood, I do a quick visual inspection. I take off the engine cover so I can see if there's any oil residue, any visible coolant leaks. Uh, I will also check the fluids, all of the fluids, uh, power steering if it has one, uh, coolant, oil level, and all that before I do any work. And I will document all that on the uh, ticket if I find, let's say, coolant was low, uh, the oil on the dipstick was low, or pretty much anything I find. And I will document that on the ticket. I'm taking off the engine cover. I bet you this engine cover has never been even taken off. So now that I have the engine cover off, I'm going to uh, look over the engine, see if I see any oil leaks. I will check the fluids. Um, using a flashlight, I will check how much uh, coolant is in the overflow tank. I will check the level and the purity of the brake fluid, if the battery has any corrosion on it. Um, obviously, I'm going to top off the washer fluid. And uh, if the car has a dipstick, I will actually check uh, how much oil was on the dipstick. And whatever I find in the engine bay before I even start the oil change, let's say I found some oil leaks or the coolant is low or anything, I will document that on my ticket. So first things first, I'm going to check the oil level. You take out the dipstick, you clean it off, you put it back in the car, pull it out and check it. As you can see, it is at a perfectly fine level. If one side looks like it's overfilled, always turn on the other side and just take a quick look at it. Because for some reason, usually on one side, it's always uh, the, the oil sticks always more than on the other. But from right here, you can see that the oil is still in spec. You want the oil to be in between the minimum and the maximum. You never want it to be below the minimum and you never want it to be over the maximum. Now it will open up the washer fluid cap and add washer fluid. We do this to every single car as a courtesy uh, that, that comes in for an oil change. We just top off all the fluids. Also, if any of the fluids are low, we will top those off as well. I personally always take off the oil cap and I place it on a rag on top of the engine and I slightly pull out the, the dipstick. This way we cause a vacuum leak so when we're actually draining the oil, the air will suck in through it and just come out faster. The second reason why I take the oil cap and put it right here is if the oil cap's not back on the motor, it doesn't have any oil in it. If I see the cap in my mind, because I always do the routine the exact same, I know cap is here, there's no funnel, it means there's no oil in the car. So I don't start the car with, any oil, with no oil in it. So now we're gonna lift the car all the way up. I am 6'6", so the car needs to go all the way up. So for me, every single car needs to go all the way up. Uh, it just makes my life easier and then I don't have to bend over and squinch. Now that we have the car all the way up, I will show you the next step that I do. So guys, if you ever do a oil change on a Mazda CX-5, this is a little compartment, but it honestly, the only thing it's here, I guess, is just to do a visual inspection because the actual filter and the oil drain is under this pl uh, plastic molding. It is held by two eight millimeters and a couple of uh, push clips. So now that I have the plastic piece cover off. The filter is right here and the drain plug is right here. So now we actually will start our actual oil change. Now using a 17 mil 
socket. I will open the drain plug and I will slowly unscrew it and cause a oil leak. As you can see right now, I'm lifting up the oil drain plug and now the oil is coming out of the car. I will let the oil drain until I can comfortably reach the oil filter. And then if it's a spin on oil filter and it's directly vertical above, I will actually make a small hole here with a punch and a hammer. That way it will cause a leak. And then when I will use my filter pliers to unscrew it a little bit, it will actually prevent the oil draining all over the filter, causing a big mess and um, you know, well, obviously I already messed up my glove, but it will prevent a bigger mess coming down the filter and the, uh, the vacuum that you just opened will cause the, all of the oil to drip out of the um, oil filter in a straight pattern rather than overflow over it everywhere. This only works if it, the, it is a spin-on filter and it is directly vertical. So now I have my punch and a small brass hammer. You don't have to use a brass hammer, but this is just the smallest hammer I have. I'll put it right in the middle, give a couple taps. Now the oil is draining out of the filter as well. Now I'll use my adjustable oil wrench pliers. I will put it on the filter, give it a couple spins. Now it is loose by hand. When I loosen it, the oil is only coming out of from that hole and it's not overflowing from the sides. It's, it's a very simple thing. The only purpose I do this is just to make less of a mess and then not have to spray brake clean everywhere. But it's really cool how that works when you cause a vacuum by unscrewing it, but you also have a small hole, the whole oil will go down through that hole rather than overflow for where the oil filter actually seats on the housing. Um, again, this I've noticed that this only works when the oil filter is vertical to the oil pan. And if it's like sideways or horizontal or anything, if you do that and you still loosen it up, it will still overflow each time. So now I will just unscrew the oil filter completely, drain it out and just let it keep draining. While the oil is draining normally, I would take this whole cover off to just check if there's any oil leaks. But because the car has only 4,000 miles and this is a Mazda, Mazdas are usually pretty reliable, I will leave the cover in and just do a quick visual inspection around to see if I see any leaks. And if I do find anything, I will let the customer know to bring it back to the dealer. So while the oil is still draining, now I will lower the car just a little bit so I can check the suspension components. So now I'm going to do a suspension shakedown. So I'll take the, the wheel and I will go up and down, see if there's any play in the bearing. I'll go side to side, feel if there's anything in the tie rods. And I will do that to all four tires just to make sure that uh, there is no play in any suspension components. And if I do find play, then I'll have to trace it down of what is the actual source of the play. Is it a wheel bearing? Is it a tie rod? Is it the inner tie rod? Is it the outer tie rod? And so on. So I'll just show you on this one tire, but I'll do that on all four. Next step in my inspection, I will just take a quick look at the tires. Uh, rub my uh, palm against the tire, see if there's any bumps on it, if there's any chopping, any inconsistencies, that would indicate that maybe the alignment is off or that um, th there's uh, suspension issues. What I also do is I use a tire tread gauge and I will measure every single tire and document it on my ticket of what I found and that way the customer knows how much tread their tires have left and what is the condition of the tires. All four tires at a, are at 930 seconds. So I will not uh, recommend tires or a tire rotation. There's just no need, but I still document it on the ticket so the customer knows. And when I give the ticket to my service advisor and they ask 
hey, how much tread is left in the tires? And rather than saying, oh, there's plenty or it's enough or whatever, I can actually give them a actual number that they can tell the customer. So right now I am checking the brake pads with my flashlight. Uh, it is very important to check the inner and outer brake pad because depending on if the caliper is sticking, it might uh, have one of the pads lower than the other and then we have to address that and let the customer know. I know a lot of mechanics only check uh, one side per axle when it comes to brakes. I always recommend checking all four sides because one side can be perfectly fine and then the other side caliper is actually sticking and it's causing the inner or outer pad to rub against the rotor more faster and lower it. So you wanna do a thorough inspection every single time because again, if the car leaves and something happens and one of the pads is almost metal to metal and it starts grinding, guess whose fault it is? It's your fault. And even if it's not your fault, it's just an inconvenience to be like, hey guys, I just did the oil change. You said it's all good with my car and then now I need front brakes. So to avoid those kind of situations and just be professional, always check every single corner of the car when it comes to brakes, tires, suspension, because you just don't wanna be in one of those situations where now you have to go and talk to your service advisor, to your boss and say like, oh yeah, I didn't do a thorough inspection. So you know, just tell them to bring it back and stuff. It's just unprofessional. And also maybe next time the client won't want to come back here because you didn't do a thorough inspection. You told him everything's fine. And then surprise, surprise, he needs front brakes, which could be you know, you know, a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars, depending on the model. So you always wanna do a thorough inspection to make sure that everything is in spec and you also want to document it. If you don't find anything wrong, you don't have to write down it. But if you do find anything wrong, you always have to document it on your computer software and also on the ticket. So the customer knows, the service advisor knows, you know, and if you ever go back into the service history, you can say, oh yeah, this was an issue 2000 miles ago. We, we let the customer know he declined the repairs. So now it's back, you know, it kind of covers your ass and uh, it, it also makes everybody's life much easier. Obviously this is a brand new Mazda, but you want to check the soft brake lines. You want to make sure that the CV boots are not ripped and it's not uh, slushing grease and, you know, check that the tie rod has no play in it. Check that the boots not ripped. If the strut is not leaking, do a thorough inspection because uh, the more thorough you are, the more it will come into your routine and just be a natural progressing thing. And every time when I do my inspections, I do them exactly the same. So every time I know that if I check this, I don't have to go over it again. Check rear shocks, check rear sway bar links. If there's any play in them, obviously, this is a brand new car, so I'm not gonna find anything, but you never know. I had a, a Land Rover, Range Rover Velar with 4,000 miles and the front ball joint was completely shot and it was clacking his ass off. So you never know. But again, it, you, you're doing this to cover your ass and just to be professional and let the customer know the condition of his car. So now that I've done my thorough inspection, the last thing I do before I put the drain plug back in with the new gasket and the new filter, I will check every single tire's tire pressures. And depending on what I find, it might just be a fill or maybe lower the pressure a little bit if the customer has been uh, topping off his own pressure and, and uh, it's not at the level it should be. But let's say if each tire is at 35 and then one tire is at 26, that could indicate me that there's maybe a nail in it, maybe it's leaking through the mead, maybe it's leaking through the TPMS sensor. So if I find one tire a little bit lower than the others, I'll do a thorough inspection on that tire to just make sure that there is no nail in it, if the rim's not cracked, if the TPMS is not leaking, because if I let it go like that and then it comes back 40 minutes later, it's like, hey guys, my TPMS light is on. Guess whose fault it is? This guy right here, because I did not catch it. So right now we'll just check the tire pressure on this tire. You can see it is at 34.6. So I'll just fill it just over one PSI because 
of the weather changing, the tire pressure has a tendency to go down because when it's cold, the tire pressure goes down a little bit. When it's hot, the tire pressure can go up a little bit. So I just put one PSI over what the recommendation is from the manufacturer. That way I prevent the, the you know, tire pressure going down and causing an issue when the TPMS lights turns on. So I just demonstrated that on one tire, but I'm going to do that on all four tires. So I checked all four tires. I didn't find any inconsistencies in tire pressure. All the tires were at either at 35 or just slightly lower than 35, which is perfectly normal. And now that I checked all my tires, I will leave the car to keep draining the oil and I will go on my computer software. Uh, our shop uses a, a site called AllData and I will check the service intervals by mileage. So the car doesn't even have 5,000 miles and as you can see at 5,000 miles the manufacturer wants you to inspect the brake fluid which we did, inspect the coolant which we did, uh, inspect the uh, brake discs which we did, uh, replace the engine oil, lubricate door, doors, uh, hood and trunk. Um, we don't do that, it's just not necessary at this mileage. Reset the oil light, we'll, we, we will do that, inspect the lights replace the oil filter. Um, it says rotate the wheels and tires, but we're not gonna do that. All four tires are at 9.30 seconds, so there's just no need to charge the customer for a service that they don't need. But you can see at 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, and all the way up to 150,000 of, of what are the recommendations from the manufacturer to replace what components and at what time. So because the car is at such low mileage, it's pretty much brand new. It, doesn't need not, it does not need anything. Uh, so right now I'm gonna lift the car all the way back up, put the drain plug back in and put the filter back in. So the first thing I do is I put the oil filter back on. Right here you can see it has like a plastic uh, cover on. Please do not forget to take it off. Honda actually, the Honda dealers actually had a TSB where some lube techs would not take this off and then screw it back in the car and cause low oil pressures because uh, the, the screen would prevent the oil flow. So you want, you want to take this off. So you take the, the plastic cover off, you take a tiny bit of oil, you go on the sealing ring, you want to lube the ring, that way when you put it on it will go on easier and also when you take it off it will come off much easier. And then just put it, you, ha you don't have to put an insane amount of torque on the oil filter. Hand tight is perfectly fine, so right now I'm actually putting resistance on the oil filter and now I know that it is in the right torque. You don't have to go crazy. Other people put uh, pliers on it or wrenches and try to tighten it. You do not need to do that. Hand tight is perfectly fine. So the next thing you wanna do is you wanna take the old washer off. I'm using a pocket screwdriver to do that. This is the old washer. We will discard it. This is the new washer. We will put it on. Sometimes on the magnetic side of the oil drain, you will actually, uh, oil drain plug, you will actually see debris on the magnet. So just use a shop rag, clean it off. You don't want to put all the debris back inside of the oil pan. So just clean it off, install the new washer. And now I will, using just my fingers, I will put it finger tight until it stops. And I will show you how little torque this drain plug actually needs and that you should never ever over torque that drain plug. So the manufacturer torque spec is from 23 to 30 uh, foot pounds of torque on the drain plug. I will use my stubby ratchet, my smallest ratchet. If you strip out the drain plug with this, then you have bigger issues. But basically you have it on the tightening uh, position you can see right here, hand tight. I cannot force any more um, torque on the tool just because of the handle being so short. So right now, this is not moving anymore. As you can see, I'm, I'm actually trying to put force. This is completely fine. It will never leak on you. It will never drain on you. 
if you replace the gasket, it will never leak on you. You will never strip out the threads. Um, this is actually a metal oil pan, so it's a little bit harder to strip, but on aluminum oil pans, it's very easy. So if you, if you don't want to use a torque wrench each time trying to uh, torque down the drain plug, just use this little stubby ratchet. Go it all the way hand tight, then put it on. As soon as you can put any more force, you're done. It's fine. You don't need to put any more torque, I promise you. Now I'll use a little bit of brake clean, spray down the new filter and uh, the drain plug, clean off any residual of the oil. And now the next step is to put the plastic cover back on it. If we have the plastic cover back on, using a shop rag, I'll just give a quick wipe down. And your goal as a professional is to make sure when you do any type of service is that it looks like nothing has ever been touched. It has to look like there, has, there is no trace of evidence of that somebody actually did the work. And that is not to uh, hide if you did the oil change or not, but just you wanna make sure that there's no fingerprints, there's no oil residue, there's no scrape marks or anything. You want it to be perfect, like it, like it was, came right out of factory because that is what separates the professionals from the rookies is when you do a job and it's perfect. You, like, so when the client looks up, if he ever lifts the car up and be like, hey, what is this oil dripping from right here? And you're like, oh, it's just from the oil drain plug. You know, it's the residual. No, you do not want that. You want it to be perfect, especially if you have a picky client. Now, when I lower the car all the way back down, I do not actually kick the arms out of it. Just in case if I forgot anything, the car is still situated on the lift. I can still put it back up in the air if I forgot to check a tire pressure or something like that because uh, when you're a flat rate mechanic or any mechanic in that, if you're hourly or whatever, you want to be as efficient as possible. So if you take the lift arms off and now you gotta put the lift arms back on, guess what? You're wasting your time, you're wasting your time, you're wasting the client's time, and you're wasting the shop's time. You do not wanna do that. You're a professional, you have to be as efficient as possible and especially at flat rate because if like in this instance the job pays only half an hour so if you're kicking the lift arms back and forth wasting precious minutes uh, basically you're just getting a pay cut so before i make sure that everything's done i will not kick out the lift arms because uh, it's just a waste of time so now we are back in the engine compartment and what i wanted to show you is uh, because I do every single oil change the exact same way, I have my own routine. If I see this and no funnel in here, I know that the car has no oil in it. And once I put the funnel in, fill in the oil, I will take the funnel out, put the plug back on, tighten it. Now I know I can safely start the car because the car has oil in it and I won't start the car dry. So it's like, it, you don't have to do it the same way I do it, but like these small things ensures me that I do the best job without doing a mistake. I am putting my funnel into the opening in the valve cover, and once I fill the oil, gravity will carry it all the way down into the oil pan. So I have my funnel ready, and now I'm going to get my oil. Before I go get my oil, I will check what grade oil and what quantity. So we have OW20 full synthetic, 4.8 quarts. Now that I have my oil ready, I will slowly start adding it to the car. The reason why you want to do it slowly is because you don't want it to overfill through the hole and then just drip on the whole motor, cause a mess and stuff like that. And if you cause a mess, guys, please clean it off. It looks very unprofessional when somebody brings your car for an oil change. You do an oil change, you overflow uh, the oil while putting it in, and then you leave the mess. The customer opens the hood, he sees all the oil. It's just a bad image, not only on you, because it's going to come directly back to you, because the customer is always going to call the service advisor and say, hey, there's oil all in the front of my motor. So, you know, because we document everything, they will know exactly who did it. And it's a bad image on you. And it's also a bad image on your shop because you want your customers to trust you and come back. It's part of the business. So if you do a shitty job, your whole shop looks bad, not only you. So you carry that responsibility as a professional to do a good job 
every single time. So let it drip a little bit. It always has a couple of drips. You can put your hand just to make sure that no drips come out and you take it away and you are done. After you filled all the oil, let the funnel still be inside for a couple of seconds. So all of it drains into the engine and then use a rag, grab it from the bottom and take it from the bottom. That way you prevent any leaks. As you can see, there is no leaks. So now you have your funnel out. You can take the um, plug, put it back in, make sure that it is tight so you don't cause a vacuum leak. Push in back the dipstick that could also cause a vacuum leak. Now remove your rug, clean off any surfaces that have any residual maybe from your gloves or anything. So now before I put the cover in, I just check that this is tight, seated. This, uh, the dipstick is seated. Now I can take my cover, put it back on the engine, make sure the cover is clipped in, give it a, a couple tucks to make sure that it just doesn't flop off. Putting the engine cover is very important. If the customer opens the hood, the first thing you notice is the engine cover is missing. If the engine cover is missing, it's a bad image. Also, you don't want the customer getting in your car and you're running out like, stop, 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 I forgot the engine cover. It's just unprofessional. And it's the little things that always reminds the customers like, oh dude, I came in, he forgot this, he forgot that, he forgot to put the tire pressures in, he forgot to put the co engine cover back on. So just be very thorough before you give the car back to the customer and make sure you have everything done that needs to be done. And that now once you give the keys to your service advisor and your service advisor is gonna give the keys back to the customer to make sure that you did not forget anything because it's just a bad image again for you and it's a bad image for the shop. If you notice, I still have the lift on the car you can push the arms out because they are locked in and the reason again why i'm doing that is because if i did forget anything i do not want to put those lift arms back in the car again so now i'm going to start the car let it run approximately 10 seconds that way all of the oil uh, goes into the oil filter and when I measure the oil on the dipstick it will give me an accurate reading because if you measure the oil on the dipstick right now the oil filter is still empty and it will give you an inaccurate reading and before I get out of the car I will also reset the service interval. So now I've set the service interval back to 5000 like I mentioned before I recommend all the cars doesn't matter what brand, what engine, I recommend 5,000 miles for every oil change. Fun fact, any Japanese made car or any American made car to reset the service interval, you do not need to use a scan tool. I have not seen a single Japanese or American made car where you need to use the scan tool to reset the service light or the so-called oil life. Um, for some European cars, you have to use a scan tool, unfortunately, that's kind of like their, their thing. Uh, but when it comes to Japanese and American cars, you do not use, you need to use a scan tool to reset the life. You just need to know where to go, what settings to put in. On some uh, American cars, you need to press the gas pedal three times. I mean, you can Google it, you can YouTube it. But again, you do not need a scan tool for Japanese or American cars to reset the service interval. So we started the engine, ran the engine for like 10, 15 seconds. Fill the oil filter with oil. Now we can check the oil. Pull out the dipstick, clean it off with a shop rag. Put it back in, pull it out. And we are dead on the money. As you can see, it is between the minimum and the maximum, not over the maximum, not below the minimum. So the oil is at um, the perfect position, put the dipstick back in, clean off any residual, double check everything you touch, always double check before you give it back to the client just to make sure that everything's tight. And all we have to do now is close the hood. So one last thing before I give the ticket back to the service advisor 
is I will transfer everything from what I written down with my hand on the ticket to the computer software so we can have it stored in our memory. And I'll also put a small sticker on the driver's side uh, windshield in the top corner. Uh, basically, the sticker only says uh, what date they should come back for an oil change, so six months from today, and uh, 5,000 miles from whatever mileage the car has right now. And the car is pretty much done. So this, uh, an oil change usually pays from 0.2 to 0.5, depending on what shop you work at. Uh, we get paid half an hour. So you know, there's a lot of things that need to be done, so you really have to be efficient and fast because time is money, obviously. The reason why a routine is very important because once you have your routine, you just have the steps you know that, okay, the plug is off, means there's no oil in it. The, fi the funnel is in, it means either I'm going to put oil in it or I already put oil in it. You know, check your tires, check your suspension, have like steps. So I treat every single car the exact same. It doesn't matter if it's a brand new Mazda or an old, you know, BMW, whatever. Uh, you have to be thorough with what you do, check the oil level, make sure there's no leaks, document everything. That way uh, you're covered, uh, the shop's covered, and the client is informed. And if you find anything, you make an estimate, you give it to the service advisor, and the service advisor will contact the customer, and potentially you might sell some work, let's say it needs brakes or anything. So if you get that sell, that sale, you get you get more time. So let's say it started with an oil change, you spend half an hour on it or even more depending on what you find because sometimes if you have to call the dealer and find parts, it, it might take you know, 15, 20 minutes on the phone just contacting the dealer for parts. But let's say you sold your brakes, that's 1.5 hours at our shop for a Japanese car. So if you sell the brakes, you do the brakes, you now, you, now this ticket is a two hour ticket. And that's exactly how we make our money. And you just want to make sure that um, you're not lying or anything. Whatever you find that um, is properly documented. And like if it needs brakes, it needs brakes. If it doesn't need brakes, please, guys, don't be one of those you know, mechanics that write up brakes, brake pads and rotors when the rotors are totally fine and the brake pads are like 5.30 seconds or 6.30 seconds because that will give a bad image on you. It will give a bad image on the shop. The client might not come back. The client even might sue you because you sold him work that doesn't need, that is not needed on his car. So you do the honest thing. Honesty goes a long way. If you're good with your customers, your customers will come back and eventually a car will need service work or repairs, whatever. And you just build trust with your client and that, that is the best way to run a business. And that's why every single card that I look over, I make sure that I treat it like it's the exact same. I treat it every card the exact same because that's how you build trust. And being a professional, you are getting paid to do a good job. So don't ever do a half job. So now finally that I checked everything, I can kick out the lift arm. So now that the oil change is done, I will give the ticket to my service advisor and he will contact the customer and tell him that the job is done. He can pick up his car. No further work is needed. It's pretty much a brand new car. Um, so yeah, guys, this is pretty much my routine. Um, I'm not saying that this is how you're supposed to do it, but this is how I do it. This is the most efficient, fastest way that I can do a proper full inspection of the car and, and do the oil change at the same time. Um, I hope that this video might help uh, younger technicians, maybe loop techs, or, or maybe people who are interested to see how what actually happens at a shop when you bring it for an oil change. I'm not saying that every single shop does that that way, but pretty much all the technicians that work in my shop do it this way. Uh, that way we ensure you know, that the customer is getting the best service. Uh, and there's so much more that comes into an oil change that the customers don't even probably realize. So maybe this video will help them see what actually happens when they bring it for an oil change. And that, that's the difference between a real shop and a quick lube where they just drain the oil, fill the oil, you tell them you need an air filter without even checking it or whatever. 
meanwhile, here we do a test drive. We listen to the suspension. We listen to how the engine works. We sh see how the transmission shifts and so on. If you guys like the video, please put a thumbs up. That helps me very much. Uh, please consider subscribing. That motivates me to make more videos for you guys. If you have uh, any tips for me, maybe, that uh, how I could improve my routine, please leave a comment down below. And if you have any questions, please leave a comment as well. I will try to answer to every single comment I see. And uh, hope you guys have a good day. I hope you enjoyed watching it. And uh, keep wrenching, guys.